You are listening to the Bible teaching ministry of Pastor Ross Graham of Grace Bible Church, Kingswood, New South Wales, Australia. Ross will be using the inerrant Word of God to draw our truth in its original context. To find more messages like this, visit www.gracebiblechurchkingswood.org or to join our online community, you can now find us on Facebook by searching for Grace Bible Church Kingswood. May this message today bless you and as always, bring glory to God. Here's Pastor Ross. Uh, those of you who have been involved uh, in some kind of a car accident uh, would know that seat belts and airbags have uh, gone a long way towards protecting life or lives in collisions. But there's no painted device that will protect us in one of life's most common collisions. And that would be the collision of, of misunderstandings. And the truth of the matter is that misunderstandings can happen anywhere, at any time, at any place. Someone misjudges our motives or misreads our actions and it can take days, it can take months or even years to repair the damage, provided of course that the relationship wasn't completely total to begin with. And I think it very true uh, to say in this place tonight, and as you've come to listen to this message, that it's very true to say that we've all experienced misunderstandings in life. We've all experienced uh, misunderstandings just like that. One minute we're gliding along uh, and life is great. It's fantastic. It's absolutely uh, wonderful. And the next uh, uh, minute someone hits us head on and things can erupt. And they can erupt like an all-in brawl at a state of origin football clash. Both benches of family and friends rush into the fray and there's every manner of verbal punching, kicking and sometimes there is biting and so on, enough to even scare the wits out of a tough rugby league player. And I want you to understand here tonight, afresh and anew, that when you are misunderstood in life, you are not alone. So let's look briefly at just a few of the ways these collisions can occur. Let me try to set a scene for you before we get to the Word of God tonight. Firstly, let me give you some examples from life. Have you ever been misunderstood when you reached out to help someone in need? You offered a little assistance only to find out that that person who smiled and who thanked you later told a friend that they thought you acted like a nosy busybody, that you were a nosy parker. Or did you ever try to gently restore a Christian friend who was wandering from the faith, had got his eyes or her eyes off the truth and had wandered so much, and you approached them with a, with a humble and, and a tender and understanding heart. But all this other person could see or hear was that you were being harsh and judgmental. And what about the time uh, your wife fixed that succulent roast? Remember that? You liked it so much that you asked the question, where did you buy this? Now, you meant that as a friendly question, a kind of indirect way of affirming her cooking. She bought a wonderful roast and the cooking was magnificent, but she took, took it as criticism and immediately went on the defensive. I can see by the smiles on some of your faces that you've been there and done that. That's right. And she immediately went on to the, on the defensive. What's wrong with it? You know, I'm getting pretty sick and tired of fixing meals that nobody appreciates. But I like the roast, he pleaded. Forget it, she sniped. It's too late. The meal's ruined. And indeed it was. Makes you wince, doesn't it? It makes you wince because we can all probably remember a meal or an evening or a special day that was ruined by some innocuous statement taken the wrong way. 
And while most understandings are easily cleared up, some, uh, like the ones in Joseph and David's lives, linger for years and result in mistreatment. So from examples in life, I want to give you a couple of examples from Scripture. Uh, you re remember that Joseph uh, grew up in a family that was knotted with misunderstandings. He had misunderstandings uh, all the way through his early years. And eventually they led to a confrontation with his brothers in which Joseph, of course, was bound and sold as a slave to Potiphar, an Egyptian official. And in the course of time, Joseph was elevated to a position of overseer in charge of all of his master's possessions. And it was while he was in that position that Potiphar's wife repeatedly tried to seduce him. And when words wouldn't sway him, she literally grabbed Joseph and tried to pull him to her. But Joseph fled, leaving his garment clutched in her hands. And I am reminded that hell hath no fury like a woman scorned and enraged by his refusal, Mrs. Potiphar screamed rape. And Mr. Potiphar came home, believed her, and Joseph spent the next two years in prison because of a misunderstanding. Joseph's treatment was harsh. But harsher still was the mistreatment that David received at the hands uh, of King Saul. You see, at first, uh, Saul, King Saul loved the shepherd boy whose skillful harp playing could soothe his tormented heart and the disturbed spirit that he had. And Saul was even delighted with David when he defeated Goliath and he routed the Philistine armies. But it wasn't long after that that Saul misconstrued David's successes as an attempt to take the throne. So the king turned on the one person who ironically was his most devoted servant. And it began with uh, Saul throwing a spear at David during one of his raving fits. And then he tried to have him killed in battle. And finally, the king dropped all of his pretenses and ordered David to be executed. From king's confidant and warrior to social outcast and criminal, David spent the next 12 years hiding in caves, always on the move, always on the run, eluding the pointed spears of Saul's mistaken jealousy. Misunderstandings that last for a day or a week can feel like a lifetime, can't they? But 12 years, 12 years, it's hard to imagine. But I want to tell you there is one who can imagine though, someone whose conception and birth and everything in between was wrapped in misunderstandings throughout his entire life. His undeserved pain and suffering didn't simply feel like it lasted a lifetime. Let me tell you, it did. And so I would ask the question here that tonight in this church, are you misunderstood? Then meet him who understands. The most understood individual who ever lived was Jesus Christ. Critics joked about his birth tittering about illegitimacy. They disputed his heavenly origin with ethnic jeers and taunts that he belonged to the devil. They scorned his purpose and condemned his teachings. And in the end, these same people crucified him as a criminal. They nailed him to a cross and his rich royal red blood was shed for each one of us. And the Apostle John wrote in John 1 verse 5, he said this, The light that shines in, in the darkness, the light shines in the darkness rather, but the darkness has not understood it, has not overcome it, has not co comprehended it, literally. And Jesus Christ collided with this uncomprehending darkness every day at just about every single solitary turn of his life. 
So for a glimpse of what it must have been like, let's turn, and you should already be there, in Mark chapter 3. Christ's heavenly light blazed as he helped and healed others. But even then, he was misunderstood. He was misunderstood especially by the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees whose hatred eclipsed their understanding. And we pick the passage up in verse 1 and 2, Mark 3. Another time he went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Now what you need to understand is this, that the Pharisees, the religious loud mouths of the day, were the rule makers. They were the consummate legalists of the day. They love handing out, as it were, uh, photocopies of all of the exacting do's and don'ts that they added to the law of Moses. Important rules such as women not allowed to look in a mirror on the Sabbath because they might discover a grey hair and commit the grievous sin of plucking it out. Give me a break, Jake. And they had another rule, one that prohibited healing on the Sabbath unless a situation was life-threatening. And Jesus, the Lord of glory, he knew all about that rule. And he knew that the breaking of that rule was punishable by death. But he also knew that the word of God said that the Sabbath was made for the man, not man for the Sabbath. You see, the truth is that God gave the Sabbath to the nation of Israel to benefit man by giving him a day of rest from all of his labors and to be a blessing to him. But the Pharisees, like many of the religious leaders today in some of the big time, big shot churches, many of the, of, of the Pharisees turned it into a burden and made man a slave to their myriad of man-made regulations. Which, by the way, nullifies the word of God. In verses 3 through 5 of the passage, we read this. Follow along in your copy of God's inerrant word. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked him, which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. You see, church, Jesus' question cut right to the heart of the law. Something the Pharisees had never touched with their rules. And for the first time in many, many years, the true light of God's Sabbath shone in that synagogue. But only the man with the restored hand felt it. Only those with an open heart saw it. But the withered hearts of the Pharisees made it impossible for them to see or feel anything but murderous hate. And we read in the sixth verse of the passage, then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Not only was Jesus misunderstood by the Pharisees, he was also misunderstood by his own people. Jesus' second intersection of misunderstanding is found a little further down in verse 20 of the passage. If you'll just drop down there and the scripture says this, Then Jesus entered a house, verse 20, Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When Christ returned to his hometown, 
such an enormous following came with him that he became completely absorbed in ministering to them. Now imagine for a moment what the scuttlebutt was among some of the older hometown folks. Say, what's the ruckus? What are all these people doing here? Haven't you heard? Jesus is back. Isn't he the fellow that quit his day job to, to, to be some sort of preacher? Yep. I hear he's got fishermen and tax gatherers for his disciples. Uh-huh, that's true. And they say he made the Pharisees fighting mad. He must be crazy. Well, what would you expect from someone who doesn't eat? Doesn't eat? That's right. Benjamin said that Nathaniel heard Jesus hadn't had a bite since he hit town. Too busy preaching and all that, talking to people about God. Now I know he's crazy. Somebody had better talk some sense into that religious fanatic before he embarrasses us all. Sound far-fetched? Read what Mark wrote in verse 21. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him for they said, he is out of his mind. First, the Pharisees plotted to kill Jesus because they misunderstood his actions. Now the hometown crowd, crowd is trying to put Jesus away because they have mistaken his passion for insanity. You might ask the question, what next? Well, let me tell you what next came the scribes, the teachers of the law. And they misunderstood Jesus' power and accused him of being demon possessed. You see, according to verse 22, a delegation of expert attorneys in the law were dispatched uh, to Jerusalem to investigate this man called Jesus. And here's what they officially concluded. We pick it up in the middle of the, the 22nd verse. And they concluded this, he is possessed by Beelzebub. By the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. Now, Jesus couldn't stop the Pharisees from plotting his death or keep old acquaintances from thinking that he was crazy. But let these so-called experts of the, of the law argue such a blasphemous misconception that his power was from Satan. And I want to tell you, Jesus said, no, no, no. This Jesus would not allow. And he made short work of them pointing out the stupidity behind their accusations. Look at that in verse 24 and following. So Jesus called them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. Case closed. But there still remains one more misunderstanding to look at. And the last collision to be examined is perhaps the one that pains us most. The one that pains all of us. And that's being misunderstood by family. Few situations hit as hard as what happened to Christ next. Look at that, verse 31. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived, and standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. Now, most biblical scholars agree that the reason Jesus' family waited outside and called for him is because they were absolutely convinced that he had lost his mind. 
They wanted to talk some sense into Jesus, maybe convince him to come back to his old job at the carpentry shop and stop all of this foolishness about being God's Messiah, about being the Son of God. And Scripture doesn't say how deeply it hurt Christ to be misunderstood by his mother and brothers. Perhaps it uh, doesn't really need to, by the way. But can I say this to you? What it does record is Jesus' gentle way of turning his family's misunderstanding into an opportunity to assert his kinship with all those who do the will of God. In verse 32, we read this. A crowd was sitting around him and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. And then he looked at those seated in a circle around him. And he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Misunderstood? In the outliving of your faith, in the outliving of your life. Here's help to get you through. In almost every family circle, among almost every circle of friends, misunderstandings exist that eat away at relationships like acid. And the longer that they are left unattended, the more corrosive they become. So the next time you're misunderstood and you need help dealing with it, try asking yourself these three practical questions. Here's the first. When misunderstandings occur, ask who. Consider the source. Try to see the uh, uh, things from the other person's perspective. It will enable you to handle the situation with a greater sense of equity and patience. Second, if it continues, ask why. Examine the reason. Could it be that you're doing something uh, without realising it? A blind spot, perhaps? You're continuing on being blind to the situation? Or is the other person just given to negativism? Thirdly, as it ends, ask what? Learn the lessons. In what way can I profit from the experience? Did you learn something about yourself that needs changing? Is the Spirit of God touching you and poking you and prodding you and trying to mold you into the conformity of His dear Son? Questions of who, why and what are useless, however, without forgiveness. Forgiveness must, M-U-S-T, must occur when there's been a collision in a relationship over some misunderstanding. Forgiveness is the key. And it doesn't necessarily mean you agree or that you will be able even to restore the relationship to its previous level of intimacy. That may not happen. Paul and Barnabas clashed over John Mark and ended up going separate ways, but there was still forgiveness. And the truth of the matter is, and we need to learn this well because it is at the very core of Christianity, that when we withhold forgiveness, and we, and by the way, we do that more than any of us would like to admit, when we withhold forgiveness, we become prisoners of our own self-made cells of bitterness. We think we're exacting revenge on this other person when in reality our bitterness is taking its revenge on us. We're the ones who suffer. 
whose capacity to, to love is diminished. Ralph Waldo Emerson once wrote, to be great is to be misunderstood. I want to say this to you tonight, to be greater, however, is to forgive the one who misunderstood. You see, Jesus was not only the greatest man to ever live, but he was also the most misunderstood and the most forgiving. Even as he hung unjustly on a cross, what did he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And trusting him doesn't protect us from being hit with misunderstandings. They'll come at us all the time, but it will enable us to survive them. To repair the damage and to heal the wounds through forgiveness. Amen and amen. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, tonight we want to thank you for the joy and the privilege of being part of your forever family. To still being able to turn to the precious word of God and to see what you have to say through scripture to us. Help us this day, Father, to reflect upon the the areas of misunderstandings that have entered our lives, perhaps in relationships or in other areas of life. Help us to deal with them through forgiveness. And Father, it just may be that there is one in this place tonight who has come to this church. It was misunderstood the, the message of the gospel that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. They came to this planet for the express purpose of going to a cross in our place to die for our sins. That he was crucified, he died and was buried and on the third day he rose again. We have missed it, we've misunderstood it. The opportunity is now given to follow this simple prayer, seeking forgiveness. Dear God, thank you for loving me. I confess that I have sinned against you. Forgive my sin. I believe that your son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross to, in my place to pay for my sin and rose again from the dead. I confess Jesus as my Lord and I receive that gift of eternal life. For we ask it in the precious and wonderful name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you for tuning in with Pastor Ross Graham. And for more information about his ministry, visit www.gracebiblechurchkingswood.org. Until next time, God bless.